Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Paul Kalnins, naturopathic physician and former professor of naturopathic medicine in Portland, Oregon. And welcome back to my series on salutogenic terrain medicine, where I've been attempting to develop a salutogenic terrain model of health that can supplement the current pathogenic cellular model of disease. Uh, please don't forget to share, like, and subscribe if you find this content valuable. And this is the 11th lecture in the series, and I would like to build upon what I've done in the lectures before, so I'll include a link to the last lecture in the description below. So slowly, I've been exploring various levels of organization within the human being, starting with the well-studied physical organization, the so-called mineral aspect within us, which can be described using the language largely of substances, of molecules, and genes and mechanisms of action, which is what we use in cellular molecular biology and genetics. So that's one level of organization. Uh, but as I've been arguing, <clears throat> each level, of, there are higher uh, levels of organization, and each level essentially has its own distinct organizing principles and laws. So the laws of genetics and molecular biology, which are based largely on chemistry, um, uh, don't apply as much to these higher levels. There's novel, uh, uh, organ organizing principles that emerge. Um, so in each of these higher levels requires its own sort of unique uh, mode of cognition for understanding. Um, I've been arguing further that our current or so-called earth analytical quantitative model um, modes of knowing, the basis of biomedicine and biomedical research, um, are currently yielding insights only into the physical organization and are not really capable of grasping the more subtle aspects, these more subtle dimensions and levels of the human being, including the fluidic, the gaseous, and the warmth organizations, and I'll be speaking about the warmth organization today. Um, this idea that the activities of molecules and genes alone is inadequate to understand the higher levels of organization in the human being has been explored in Western biology, uh, in the school of thought that I mentioned in the last lecture known as organicism. Organicists started in the 1920s. They differed from vitalists in that they didn't propose a metaphysical or mystical system of vital forces that emerge, uh, that are active in the human being. Uh, rather, they argue that there are higher levels of organization, uh, that these emerge from lower levels, and that bottom-up explanations were inadequate here, that the higher levels of organization acted as a whole, um, and that they had sort of a top-down uh, causality on the lower levels. Um, so these, these holes can work down into the parts again. Um, these higher levels, these holes, <coughs> really organize the parts, the cells, the molecules, and genes into a whole. Uh, but they're not reducible themselves to the parts. And I think that's a very important principle that we don't discuss much in medicine, where there's a lot of focus on the parts, but these holes, which are emergent properties, um, have their own causality and can, through top-down causation, affect the lower levels. So many organicists and now developmental biologists uh, are really have, they were and have been focused on the problems of morphogenesis, the development of patterns in living organisms through embryology, and morphostasis. How do those patterns remain in the adult organism? Um, the process of pattern formation really is key to developmental biology, of course, but it's also a key factor to medicine. Um, really understanding how adult tissues and organs, for example, maintain their forms is really key to how they maintain their health. Uh, a breakdown in the organ's formative activity will lead to functional disturbances and eventually disease. So I would argue that understanding the processes that maintain organ and tissue forms, morphostasis, uh, are really key to understanding the terrain of the body. And this, as I've discussed, is the key to understanding how to properly support salutogenic function versus just focusing on pathogenic mechanisms. So organicists argue that each layer of organization can be conceptualized as a field of activity. And I discussed that in the last lecture is the morphogenetic field. Um, thus, instead of discussing individual genes and molecules, uh, they place a greater emphasis on what they call the morphogenetic field. Uh, and this is a field that really turns the genes on and off and guides long-term pattern formation in living organisms. However, the morphogenetic field concept has been largely rejected uh, by biomedicine for a variety of reasons. Uh, one being, at least in the early conceptions of the field model, there were no known physical fields like electromagnetic fields that could explain all the effects of morphogenesis. And that's still the case. A lot of people, when they begin to talk about fields, biofields, and whatnot in the body, they often 
uh, go back to electromagnetic fields. But the reality is EM fields are inadequate for explaining long-range pattern effects in organisms. So there certainly is an EM aspect that's been measured, for, for example, around the heart. Um, you know, there's an electromagnetic field that extends meters beyond the heart outside the body. Um, but the field alone is probably, that, that electromagnetic field is probably inadequate to understand morphogenesis, morphostasis. So there's some other types of fields. And I want to come back to <clears throat> that idea. The early organicists really didn't provide testable hypotheses because they didn't really think the fields were real. They thought they were more like metaphors. And that's what developmental biologists today still think is that these are more metaphors for understanding long range pattern formation in tissues. Um, or that they really, the fields are just chemical gradients and they don't have any reality beyond that. But uh, many are, are starting to argue this idea that the fields really are real entities and that they can have actual physical effects. They can change the probabilities of chemical reactions occurring in a tissue. So that takes it away from the mineral aspect and puts it into more of a life aspect that um, these fields can guide, again, the development of form. So I'm going to come back to that in the future video because I think this concept of morphogenic fields is extremely important, especially in natural medicine <clears throat> where it's not discussed much. Um, and I want to suggest some of the new evidence in terms of what kind of physical basis they might have. But before going there, <clears throat> I need to introduce one further level of organization, uh, one additional field of activity, and that is the so-called human warmth organization. So in the last lecture, I focused on what I refer to as the air organization in animals and humans. Um, this level of organization is added on top of our physical <clears throat> and our fluidic organisms. Um, and it appears through a process of gastrulation during embryological development. It leads to, as I discussed, a sort of internalization of processes in the outer environment within an inner space in animals and humans. So, <clears throat> for example, in vertebrates, starting with fish, I explored how first there's the development of a sort of skin, uh, and then this separates to some degree the fish from the outer environment. But now there's a central nervous system and a system of senses that allows the fish to respond to that environment and then coordinate that internally in a system of reflexes and whatnot. Um, and then in amphibians, we see then on top of the central nervous system and skin, there's added a system of breathing. So in frogs, we see uh, lung development. Uh, and then uh, in reptiles, there's a system of internal water regulation with a more advanced kidney system. And then birds, a system of warmth regulation uh, interestingly, a four-chambered heart, and then in mammals as well, warmth organization, and now an internal reproductive system. So it's as if these outer functions, for example, I mentioned the idea of the lunar forces in the outer world where reproduction in the lower invertebrates happens, like in the uh, uh, coral reefs that just, and, and in fish, they just eject their eggs and sperm into the water and fertilization happens externally. By the time we get to mammals, that process has been internalized. Uh, and with it, the sort of lunar rhythm, the 28-29 day rhythm, has also been internalized. So with this increased sophistication of an inner world, with organs and a system of homeostasis and whatnot, um, there emerges what we uh, can refer to as consciousness, or what some have referred to as soul, uh, an experience of sensations and instincts and reflexes, desires and feelings. Uh, so now added on to the purely vegetative and life processes of the fluidic body, uh, animals and humans have the capacity for consciousness. Um, they possess a form, the physical body, life activities, the fluidic body, and then this consciousness body, which I'm equating here to the gaseous body, internal breath. And in many traditions, uh, the idea of pneuma or soul was connected with the breath, with air. Um, although we usually associate consciousness with the nervous system, it's clear that if we observe the processes of animal evolution, uh, that organs emerge alongside of the nervous system. They, they emerge in conjunction, basically, and there's sort of a correlation. And studies have revealed interesting connections. For example, the length of the intestinal tract and brain development, and now there's a lot of interest in looking at the microbiome of the intestinal tract. Um, humans, interestingly, have a relatively short GI tract compared to many mammals. Uh, in, in compared relative to their body size. And, uh, they, and we as humans have a more complex central nervous system and brain. So it seems that there's an inverse relationship between the length of the intestines and the brain 
development. Um, there's a lot of talk now about the gut-brain connection, but also the heart-brain, the liver-brain, the kidney-brain connection is beginning to emerge as well. So this idea that the organs are connected with our soul life, <clears throat> with consciousness, really is key to understanding mental health. And uh, I will say a lot about that in the future because I think that's a big missing element. Uh, just speaking about neurotransmitters and whatnot, seems to not really address the full picture. And what I'd argue here is that there are subtle organ imbalances occurring in many mental health disorders that if addressed, will dramatically improve the, uh, you can say the soul's capacity to function through those organs. Rudolf Steiner uh, referred to this body of consciousness the, as the astral body. And this was taken from earlier traditions, from theosophy and other traditions. And the astra stars, meaning that there's he, he sort of suggests that there's, a, there's a, a sensitivity of this body to outer cosmic rhythms, for example, the lunar rhythms. And today I'll say a little bit about the solar rhythms with the warmth body. Um, so this is to differentiate it from what he called the etheric body or the life or plant body, and then the physical or mineral and or death body. Um, so we have animals and humans have all three of these sort of put together. Uh, in plants, I mentioned the sort of so-called gas consciousness astral body stands more on the outside of the plant and works through the insect world, through the wind, through that, and it touches the plant in the region of the blossom and maybe internalizes a bit in alkaloid formation, as I discussed, uh, but largely stands outside. Um, so again, in animals and humans, we take those forces inwardly and we form a whole system of, uh, of homeostasis, of organs and whatnot that can regulate an inner environment. In the language of morphogenetic fields, we might refer to this as the astral field, uh, which works in and through the etheric and physical body, uh, physical fields of the body. So those three fields are the three biofields that we've discussed so far. These astral fields are involved in consciousness, but also, as I've discussed, in molding and shaping our bodies. Um, they direct the life activities to provide the forms of our bodies, including our organs. Uh, and this is what Steiner called the formative forces and are key to understanding how organs and tissues really maintain their proper organization. Thus, our soul emotional life is directly connected with the very life activities that maintain our form. And I discussed that interesting idea from Steiner and others in the 19th century, that basically the forces of consciousness strip life away from the nerves, but also other organs. And we utilize the life activities that, for example, were active in embry embryo embryologic development of those organs, we liberate them into higher consciousness. It's a very interesting idea that life and consciousness have a sort of duality. And we know that from daily experience, stress, increased consciousness in a way, uh, in nerve activity has a sort of deadening catabolic effect on the anabolic rebuilding properties of the life activities. Um, so it seems that there's a direct uh, sort of antithesis between the two. And really, understanding health and disease requires understanding that balance between those two fields, those two fields of activity. Um, so as I've discussed in the last video, it's always important to think about both the substances and matter in the body, um, you know, what we put in and even remedies and the molecules of our medicines and so forth, but also the form of the forces, those forces that mold and shape <clears throat> matter into the discernible forms that we see expressed through the phenotypes, the shapes of organisms. Um, the form of the forces don't come from the genes, but rather from the morphogenetic fields, which in turn regulate the gene expression. So this is a bit different than the current genetic determinism, which is where everything comes from the gene. And as I've argued, there's a lot of mysticism in that because we make up these gene programs that aren't really entities. Genes are simply blueprints for proteins. And then how those genes turn on and off is still largely a mystery in every given cell and tissue at the right time. What coordinates all that activity? That's still a tremendous mystery. You know, one analogy here that's helpful is the analogy of building a house. So first you need the raw materials, bricks, lumber, windows, etc. Uh, and this is similar to the genes and molecules, including carbohydrates, amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, minerals, and so forth in the body. Uh, next, you need construction workers uh, to put all the parts together into a house. And this would be akin to the activities of the fluidic body, or the so-called etheric body from the Steinerian perspective. Um, so the fluidic forces would, the life activities, help to organize and build those parts into something higher. But then you need a blueprint that essentially guides the fluidic body. And I'm arguing here that blueprint is coming from the guiding field 
of the astral. So the astral field or astral body, the consciousness body is guiding the activities. Just like in nature, we see the wind guide the water, basically create wave formations and whatnot. And then the waves erode the rock and change the physical. So there's sort of a connection directly. It's not just a dualism where we have body and then we have mind or consciousness. Consciousness works through these more subtle elements down into the physical and vice versa. So there's a constant process weaving between consciousness and the physical activities in the body. Um, my biggest argument really is that in, in the series of lectures really is that modern medicine is largely focused on the raw materials of the body uh, and really has lost sight of the construction workers, the etheric and the blueprint, the architect. So um, that's what I wanna try to start to reintroduce here through these lectures. So now I wanna really focus in on one aspect of these internalized functions, uh, that of internalized warmth. Um, and this first emerges in birds and mammals, but it comes to its highest level of differentiation in human beings. Um, physiologic warmth really manifests through the production of heat in cellular mitochondria via ATP synthesis. So some of the electrons that instead of going into making ATP are shunted as heat. Um, and this process occurs in every cell, um, but heat is mostly generated in skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue. Um, which is, these are both very rich in mitochondria. And this process of ATP heat production requires oxygen. So that's delivered to the cells via the blood capillaries. And the byproduct, of course, is carbon dioxide, which is then carried away by those capillaries and exhaled by the lungs. It's really fascinating to realize that when we combust the molecules for food, of food for energy and heat, the bulk of the matter of those molecules is converted to CO2. So we don't really lose weight by burning extra calories, as a lot of people say, in heat and energy. Rather, we literally exhale our weight in carbon dioxide. So uh, this very interesting relationship between weight and breathing, which, uh, which I'll come back to when I discuss the lungs in a much further lecture, in a later lecture. Um, of all mammals, human beings have the most number, interestingly, of circulatory anastomoses. Anastomoses are little shunts between the arteries, the small arteries called arterioles, and the small veins called venules. So in a way, human beings have the greatest capacity to regulate and distribute blood flow to the tissues to regulate heat production, basically. Um, and uh, so that's very interesting that, you know, this is the warmth, warmth organization is we can say most internalized of all mammals in human beings and most differentiated. Um, the master regulator of this warmth metabolism on a physiologic level is of course the hypothalamus. This is a region of the brain just behind the eyes. Um, and the hypothalamus communicates with the pituitary gland, uh, which then activates various glands in the body. And these secrete various hormones to help regulate body temperature. So things like thyroid hormone and adrenal and sex steroids like progesterone. Um, the hypothalamus also regulates the so-called fight or flight uh, nervous system or sympathetic nervous system. And that too, by increasing catabolism in tissues, the breakdown of matter will essentially liberate more heat. Um, so hypothalamus is sort of a central regulator of that heat production. Um, this regulation of the hypothalamus is tied essentially to a 24-hour rhythm or so-called circadian rhythm. So although we have an average human body temperature of 98.6, which interestingly seems to be on an average going down in people with every decade, um, the body temperature uh, essentially rises and falls throughout the day. So basically it's, it's highest during the day when we're most active physically, but also most active in consciousness. Um, and then at night it's the lowest. So we actually, our temperature dips down. Uh, at night. So there's a nice circadian rhythm. And what's interesting is that a lot of disease states we now have found are correlated with a breakdown of that rhythm. So cancer is one example. So studying the cancer temperature curve, uh, temperature curves in cancer patients, um, we often see a breakdown of that. And so one interesting idea is to, again, think of the warmth organization as a real entity that can be supported and that that would be one measure we can use as a biomarker for health in general. Um, so going back to this process of gastrulation, you know, of the outer forces and even so-called planetary, like the lunar activities that are internalized, it's interesting really to ponder the connection between our internal warmth organization, the circadian rhythm that regulates warmth, and the sun, the outer solar cycle, 
uh, which of course has a daily rhythm, but also a seasonal rhythm. So I, we haven't studied much the warmth regulation in humans over the seasons. There is some research on that. But basically there is clearly a 24 hour warmth rhythm, which correlates with the activity in the sun and the sky. Um, so we can think of our internal warmth body as internalized sun, solar activity on a metaphorical level. Um, physiological warmth is really highly structured uh, in human beings, as I mentioned. Each tissue has its own warmth uh, that's governed by the highly differentiated circulatory system. Uh, estimates are, interestingly, that the average human being has about 60,000 miles of blood vessels, including capillaries, if you stack them end to end. Uh, tremendous length of blood vessels. Um, and um, in states of health, this warmth organization and the circulation that maintains it uh, should be highly symmetrical on either side of the body. Um, and we can use thermography cameras, um, these are infrared cameras, to pick up heat signatures on the outside of the body. Uh, and when you do that, you see that often in disease states, uh, one side of the body is highly asymmetrical with regards to heat as the other, so more cold versus hot. And then uh, this has been looked at, for example, in acupuncture studies, where uh, post-treatment then, after an acupuncture treatment, that warmth body seems to distribute better now. There's more of a symmetry, and there's usually that correlates with, with an improvement in the symptoms. Um, so thermography and uh, can be useful for picking up on the surface of the skin. It can't detect the organ warmth, but on the surface of the skin, uh, what's going on with the warmth body. Now, the immune system is highly centered in warmth, um, and this is through inflammation and fever. Uh, and through that, we maintain a healthy interstate that's really unfavorable for microbial growth and proliferation. Uh, white, cell, white blood cells secrete a variety of protein signaling molecules, the cytokines, uh, to coordinate these activities uh, of what we might call the immune warmth regulation, which can be highly specific. Um, and this really, this point of our connection with the immunity and our warmth body can't be emphasized enough. You know, maintaining a proper warmth organization is essential for immune health uh, in general and for it to carry out its activities. So when we often think of fever today, a lot of people think that's something that's a negative thing that should be suppressed. We want to get the fever down, feel better again. Uh, but the thing is, we now know fever has a tremendous salutogenic role. Uh, it's essentially cleaning house, so it's reading the burden in tissues and cells of various toxins and creating, again, an unfavorable environment for microbes. Um, and we know there's evidence now that suppressing a fever with Tylenol and so forth, uh, when, you know, it's maybe not indicated, um, suppressing a fever really can result in more allergies, for example, more chronic infections, some speculation about autoimmune disease, that's a loose speculation, but but um, this idea that fever has a, a salutogenic supportive role is extremely important when we think about that and that you know, a lot of our modern therapies could be doing more harm to people uh, for the vast majority than doing good when we work to lower fevers that don't need to be lowered and shouldn't be lowered. Um, there's a lot of discussion today about inflammation and how various diseases are associated with inflammation. Uh, which then becomes a target um, using conventional therapies like NSAIDs, um, but also so-called natural means to fight. So there's, for example, an increasing use of turmeric and discussion around turmeric uh, as a natural anti-inflammatory. However, we need to differentiate acute inflammation, which is more qualitatively hot, from cold inflammation, uh, which is more chronic. Um, and in general, acute inflammation we want to encourage within certain boundaries, of course, uh, as this serves really to clean up the tissues, to stimulate removal of wastes, and stimulates tissue regeneration and healing. Um, chronic inflammation, on the other hand, might be thought of in some cases as sort of a stuck acute inflammation. It's an inflammation that wasn't able to uh, realize its goal, its, its uh, end point, which is to clean out those tissues. Maybe there was an intracellular toxin or something that the inflammation wasn't able to to uh, rid the body of. Um, and so basically chronic could be thought of as more of a stuck acute inflammation. And in those cases, you know, we don't really want to suppress that inflammation. We want to actually encourage circulation in the tissues, encourage removal of waste, so try to assist the body in what the inflammation originally would have done. Uh, what's interesting is when we think about turmeric from a salutogenic role, 
and in traditional medicines. It's discussed not as an anti-inflammatory, but for example, in traditional and classical Chinese medicine, turmeric is classified as a blood mover. In other words, it improves circulation into the tissues. And so it'd be more appropriate for chronic inflammation, not to suppress as an anti-inflammatory, but rather to support the tissues uh, to carry out their natural healing. And uh, I'll go into that in further lectures because I think that's a very important point here. But there are also higher aspects to warmth. There's also psychological warmth, uh, warmth of feeling such as sympathy or coldness of feeling, uh, antipathy. Uh, we can see a change in facial color uh, due to a change in the circulation in the face with certain emotional states. So we see red with anger often or pale with fear. So the warmth body in circulation um, highly connected here also with the feeling life. Um, and we can cultivate a sense even more subtle uh, than that sense used to perceive feelings that I discussed in the previous lectures, the so-called inspirative cognition, uh, according to Rudolf Steiner. Um, uh, and this is that cognition, or we can call it feeling cognition, that allows us to perceive feelings in others and our own inner feeling states. Uh, we can also develop this more subtle sense to read the warmth state in another. Um, and Rudolf Steiner referred to this as intuitive consciousness. So instead of just intellectual, imaginative, inspirative, now we have intuitive consciousness, four modes of knowing again, corresponding to those Greek four elements that I spoke about before, earth, water, air, fire, if we think of them as modes of cognition. Um, and this allows us to have a direct and immediate experience of another's warmth, um, really, and I'll argue here that the warmth essentially is connected with that highest aspect of ourself, what we might call our I, our essential being. So intuition, intuitive cognition allows us to directly grasp that. And this bypasses any sort of intellectual analysis. Um, others have referred to the sense as thinking with the heart uh, as opposed to thinking with the brain. Um, with some reflection, we can see that human beings possess even more subtle aspects of internal warmth, uh, what we might call mental spiritual warmth. Um, and this is really the connection with what warms us, what fills us with enthusiasm. So for example, connection with higher ideals, values, goals, higher thoughts, sense of purpose. Um, when we tune into ourselves, tune into our higher self, this is often said, and we achieve a sort of creative flow state, you're, and you're connected with some sort of purpose and you're engaged in your limbs in, in manifesting that purpose, uh, really subtle observation reveals we're in that warmth element. And that's interesting to think about purposeful activity uh, and how that engages the warmth body versus purposeless activity like, oh, I was told I need to go run on the treadmill for 30 minutes. That doesn't engage the warmth body in the same way. In fact, it's interesting how we hold the warmth back in some areas. We're often still in our head um, and um, the rest of the body, that warmth is not distributed in the right way in that case. But when you're doing something you're very passionate about, uh, creating something, um, building something, you know, that warmth uh, manifests in a very different way. Um, when we really follow these higher ideals and goals and purpose, uh, then we're engaging in the warmth. Um, and one aspect of that warmth in relationship to others is the, the warmest of feeling in a way, and that is love. So when you're warming up to someone, when you've warmed to them, you're in that state of love, which can be experienced as warmth. Um, you know, this warmth, this connection with higher ideals and whatnot really has to do with the life of morality in a sense, you know, and what we might say is conscious or what is conscience, what we think is right or wrong. Um, although morality is really discussed as sort of a social convention, uh, something we all just kind of agree upon to live harmoniously with one another, there's research conducted from around the world which suggests that human beings have internal sense of right or wrong. Uh, no matter which culture you come from. It's sort of a universal quality. Uh, we feel warm to what is right and we feel cold to what is not. And if you really pay attention to your inner decision-making process, um, it really feels that warm, cold kind of polarity. Um, we might argue that those who are acting immorally are really disconnected from their ability to sense their warmth organization 
which prevents the activities of conscience from properly manifesting. And it suggests something interesting that maybe we don't need external moral laws, that basically within our own physiology, we have built in sort of that sense. And if we train people to essentially become more aware and conscious of that, um, that less, fewer immoral acts would be committed. Just an interesting hypothesis. Rudolf Steiner argued that this warmth organization is really the seat of our not just consciousness, but self-consciousness, self-awareness, as opposed to our simple sentient awareness that we have in the gas organization. Uh, and from this level of organization, we can essentially, we have the ability to self-introspect, to, to reflect on our thoughts, our habitual patterns, our emotional patterns, effectively going against habit and instinct. So that's interesting about humans is that uh, sometimes on a negative sense, we can question our instincts. We can question what nature has given us and say, I want to do it differently. I don't want to go to bed with the sun. I want to stay up later. A uh, teenager is going to rebel against everything that might be safe for them and create, you know, do extremely dangerous activities in a way pushing the edges. You don't see that anywhere else in the animal kingdom. Um, so in a sense, there is this ability to go beyond nature, which has, again, it's a double-edged sword. We can uh, use that in a creative sense to develop new solutions, new ideas to problems, new solutions to problems, new ideas. Um, at the same time, we can commit what we might call evil acts or become immoral and go against the natural code. So uh, this is where, in a way, we are lesser than many animals in that sense because we essentially don't have we're not strongly driven by these instincts but we do have the capacity for freedom to question those instincts and that is another higher manifestation of the warmth body is essentially the capacity for freedom uh, as well as self-awareness um, <clears throat> you know we're so you know <clears throat> immersed in this warmth this is really the seed of what we might call our eye or ego. Ego, this differentiates it from the ego. Ego meaning more our lower self, maybe our more personality connected more with our habitual patterns and traits. But the ego is more that connection with what people might call the higher self, higher spirit. Uh, so the warmth organization, seat of the eye, really is not just the soul, this is the spirit. And so this is an important thing that has been lost in Western culture. We often equate soul and spirit as the same thing. But through this discussion, we would argue that actually body, the physical and the living forces, soul, the gas, so-called astral organization, according to Steiner there, and then spirit would be more the connection with this higher aspect of ourselves. And it makes us go, helps us go beyond ourselves. We connect with the warmth of others, and we're doing that constantly. Um, it's just that we're not, just like a fish in water, we're not aware that we're swimming in warmth. We become warm to someone, we pull that warmth away, whether it be in our thoughts or in our actual bodies. Uh, so it's something to you know, self-observe and, and, and pay attention to a little bit there. Um, so really a direct way of entering into this warmth organization is through meditation and being mindful. And that's really one of the core benefits of meditation from this perspective. It allows us to rise up the tumultuous currents uh, of the air astral body and essentially allows us to observe them neutrally, uh, not react to them, and effectively back ourselves away from them a little bit. So not to become unemotional, but rather to not become swallowed up by the emotion in a way. Uh, and this gives us, again, a certain amount of freedom from being controlled by those currents. Uh, we might say in meditation, we're really pulling our awareness out of the nerves. Um, and uh, the nerves, again, are our primary vehicle for the astral organization. And we're putting it more into the blood. And one very interesting phenomena that happens for a lot of meditators, happens to me when I meditate, is after a point, I suddenly start to feel the surge of warmth in my ears and other places. Maybe others have had that as well. And, you know, we might say, well, that's the nervous system relaxing. But that is, we say, we're moving more in our awareness into the blood element, uh, out of the nerves, in a sense. So, uh, and that's putting us more in contact with these higher working forces of the warmth organization. Um, and in doing so, we become less catabolic. That, remember, the nerves have a very catabolic aging effect upon the life activities. And by pulling 
this out, the Worms organization helps to maintain that. One image I've, I've heard is this interesting idea of thinking about a horse, that would be the astral body. Uh, it eats the vegetation, that's the vital plant body. And the um, essentially the rider would be the warmth organization, which is restraining the horse and constantly trying to guide it in the right direction. And that's sort of the analogy that we can use here uh, in meditation. Um, you know, whereas feelings come mostly from our experience of the astral body, um, we can say that our thoughts, especially our higher thoughts here, our conscious thoughts, not just our program thinking, are products of our warmth bodies. Um, and in this view, our thoughts are not produced by our brains. Rather, the brains are more like receivers for warmth, warmth transmissions from the field, from the morphogenetic fields around us. And that's where collective thoughts we can tune into those in a certain way through our warmth body. And uh, what's interesting is, again, going back to Rudolf Steiner, he argued we have not five senses, but 12. And one of those senses was the sense of thought. Uh, another sense, uh, so the sense of thought is that you can perceive a concept, perceive a thought. Uh, another sense uh, of those 12 would be the sense of another's eye, that we can detect the warmth in another and we can realize this is an embodied human being, this is not a robot. And so that's the ultimate so-called Turing test. Could we tell the difference between a human and a robot? From this perspective, if you learn to recognize warmth, unless the robot somehow is able to uh, create that, uh, that uh, warmth organization stands apart as something separate from a robot and uh, some separate from a machine. Um, Steiner observed, and um, essentially several other early development biologists observed this as well, that the warmth organization is most internalized, again, in humans out of all animals. Um, and just like in gastrulation, we see an emergence of a new system of forces in animals. In humans, this internalization also leads to a new system of forces and activities. And that's, again, these activities related to thought, for example, but also the ability to stand upright. And that's a challenging one. We again think humans are just animals uh, evolved to a different level. But if you really look at the human frame, there is uh, as if a new system of forces working that works in relationship to gravity very differently. It's not horizontal. Even in apes, there's sort of a still of a horizontal tendency with the jawline and whatnot. But in humans, this uprightness, uh, which happens around the age one, you know, when babies start stop crawling and now they start walking. Um, it's as if something is pulling up the human being. And so we have the vertical gesture like we had in the plants before, but in the plants, the root processes, which I'll talk about in a future video here, really correlate more with our head processes. So in a way, in plants, their heads are in the ground and their genitals, the flowers, are in the air, and we are oriented oppositely. So plants, the animals, and then humans in the vertical sense. So this, um, this warmth organization, according to Steiner, but you know, we can also just study the development of organisms, evolutionary biology, see that there is this new system of forces that really works to buoy us up against the forces of gravity vertically. Uh, but that leads to a freeing of the shoulder girdle uh, and the upper rib cage and the larynx, and this allows for the capacity for higher speech. Uh, for expressing words, concepts, feelings. And so instead of having to move our arms or whatnot and our legs to uh, communicate with the world, we can do so through speech, inner movement, where we shape the breath um, through these actions that are highly tied with our warmth organization. Uh, and we can feel the spirit of another, we say their warmth, through their voice. How engaged are they in that? Um, how disengaged are they in that? And, and that's something, if you just close your eyes and listen to how someone is speaking, it tells you a lot about their inner warmth states, or I would argue here their spiritual state. Um, these are really controversial and difficult ideas, I know, because modern education really tells us we're just advanced apes in that sense. Um, but and this is not to say that we that isn't true from a certain evolutionary perspective. But it's also, you know, to say that there, there does seem to be a different system of forces which is leading to this change in body plan, body type in a way, uh, in orientation of the body, but also these higher capacities associated with higher thought, 
creativity, morality, and so forth. That's not to say that these don't happen in individual cases in animals either. That's been well observed. Animals have creativity to a certain degree, many of them, and they can create tools and things like that. Uh, but it's to say that in humans we see this capacity coming to fruition. It's very interesting in uh, many animals, they specialize in their activities brilliantly. So a bird with its wings, you know, uh, uh, a whale with his flippers and whatnot. So, so basically, in its tail, so basically each animal can adapt to a specific environment very well, but it can't live in all environments. Well, human beings are interesting. We're not very good at anything. We don't really adapt. We have sort of a pretty basic body plan when it comes to the vertebrate body types. Um, but basically, because of that, we can adapt to any environment. We can create tools and suits to put ourselves in. We can swim. We can fly. So it's very interesting how, in a way, with humans, we've held back the physical expression of these ideas, and now we can manifest them through thinking. So again, it's a shift in the way that these inner forces are working. Um, this is, again, not to say that humans are somehow better than animals. Rather, it's just to acknowledge a system of differences. and new forces that seem to be emerging, new levels of organization, and I'm referring to this as the warmth organization. So we have in humans really a fourfold system of fields or bodies or organizations, the physical, the fluidic life, the gaseous consciousness, and then the warmth self-consciousness, self-awareness activities. Um, these are really the four dimensions that one needs to look at in medicine to understand fully a human being. This warmth body is really giving human beings the capacity for not just memory, but biography. We have a sense of I, a sense of self, which again, we want to in a higher sense transcend a little bit to become less self-centered, to become more engaged with others in the world and so forth. But at the same time, we, we find that inner core of ourselves through the warmth organization. So these are four subtle fields, four biofields that need to be worked with. And again, the significance of this is that in a salutogenic model of health, one needs to look at all four fields. Uh, it also is significant to say that what we call mind and feelings and so forth really are not disembodied. They don't just somehow magically emerge or stand parallel to uh, nerves and whatnot, but they work very much through the warmth, through the gas, down to the fluid, down to the solid. So there's a connection between mind and body here. It's a, it's a continuum uh, based on these more subtle shades of matter. And the thing is, we've really focused so far mostly on the physical, so we've missed these more subtle connections here. So that is a little introduction to the warmth organization, which I will be touching upon as we go uh, on in these lectures. Uh, but now I want to start, you know, putting this, trying to put all this together so it's meaningfully clinically. We can start to see how do we put all this together, use it uh, uh, to help us understand that maybe a condition like migraine or hypertension or diabetes from a salutogenic perspective and not just the usual pathogenic cellular models that we have today. Again, not to say those models are wrong, but rather that this is a higher dimension that we want, want to add on top of that understanding. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. Uh, thanks for listening. And again, if you find the content valuable, please share, like, and subscribe. And uh, thanks for following along.